Apple released the Mac Studio and they made some interesting, if not exaggerated claims. How does the Mac Studio really perform against a comparable PC? And with this new desktop, did Apple get it wrong? Let's get into it. There have been so many reviews of the new Mac Studio and most of them are very positive. I did a previous video challenging Apple's assertions at their March 8th event. And when the reviews went live, many reviewers could not substantiate Apple's claims. In fact, they confirmed the opposite. Also, many compared the high-end M1 Ultra versus the entry-level M1 Max, and the results are a bit of a mixed bag as to whether or not the M1 Ultra is really worth the additional $2,000. It's something I expected when I compared actual claims on Apple's websites and with my experience with Threadripper. I fully understand that double the cores doesn't directly translate into double the performance depending on the application you are using. But what really got me was that there were many saying that the Mac Studio with the M1 Max is a great value at $19.99. But is it? To test the new Mac Studio, I ordered the entry level M1 Max version. Just like I don't need a 24 core or 64 core Threadripper, I also don't need a 20 core M1, so the base model is just fine. Many of the comparisons I have seen have not compared the entry level Mac Studio to a comparable PC. Now back in 2020, I built my latest gaming rig and I was able to install macOS on a separate SSD. I did that to compare how this gaming machine running macOS would perform against the ridiculously priced $6,000 Mac Pro. I named this rig Big Mac. I won't rehash the results here, you can check out that video if you're interested. But shortly after that build, and before the latest GPU mining boom, I was fortunate to pick up a Vega 64 for just under $250 to upgrade from its RX 580. So I wanted to know, how does the M1 Max and the Mac Studio compare to Big Mac? Let's compare the specs. For the CPU, the Mac Studio has 10 cores, 8 performance plus 2 efficiency. Big Mac has the i9-9900K with 8 cores and hyper-threading. The Mac Studio has 24 GPU cores, while Big Mac has a Vega 64 GPU. They both have 32 gigabytes of RAM. The Mac Studio comes standard with 512 gigabytes, while Big Mac has a one terabyte Gen 3 NVMe SSD. Back then, I was able to build Big Mac for a price of $16.35. Now I updated Big Mac to run the same version of Monterey. Shout out to the great information provided at Dortania and Tony Mac x86 and I installed the same version of apps to benchmark. This is the best apples to apples comparison that you can get. With all the glowing reviews of the Mac Studio, you might think it's going to squash Big Mac with its old hardware. Let's find out. Starting with the CPU benchmarks. In Geekbench 5 single core, the M1 Mac scored 1792, while the i9 scores 1395. In multi-core, the M1 Mac scores 12.7, while the i9 couldn't break 10. That results in the i9 losing out to the M1 Max by about 22%. Ouch. Moving on to Cinebench R23 in single core, the M1 Max scored 1535, while the i9 scored just under 1300 at 1295. So the i9 is 18% behind the M1 Max. In multi-core, the M1 Max scored 12.3, while the i9 scored 12.8 for a 3% win. In the CPU cycles render using Blender, you can see that the i9 finished the render sooner than the M1 Max in every test for an average of 27% better. Also, I used the new Blender benchmark where the result is now in samples per minute and a higher number is better. In Monster, the i9 is 20% faster than the M1 Max CPU. In Junk Shop, the i9 is 27% faster. In Classroom, the i9 is 23% faster. On average, the i9 is 23% faster than the M1 Max CPU. In compiling code using the Xcode benchmark, the M1 Max finishes in just over a minute and a half at 92 seconds, while the i9 required over 2 minutes at 130 seconds. That means the M1 Max finishes 29% faster. In Logic Pro, running the new Logic benchmark test for a 30 minute loop, that's right, 30 minutes as I wanted to make sure this was absolutely stable, the M1 Max was able to play 169 tracks, while the i9 was able to play 152 tracks, so the M1 Max allows 11% more tracks. In apps not yet optimized for Apple Silicon, the M1 Max must run under Rosetta 2, and that still happens for many people. To get an idea of the difference, I ran several benchmarks. Pause the video if you are interested and want to look at the numbers in more detail.
What is interesting to note is that the M1 Mac CPU performance is the same whether it's in a MacBook Pro or Mac Studio. When you look at the operating frequencies of the CPU cores, you find that the CPU in the Mac Studio is no faster than the CPU in the laptop. The single core speeds are similar and the all core frequencies are identical. The only difference is that it is now running much cooler due to the large heatsink in the Mac Studio. With Apple Silicon, gone are the days where you could expect better performance on a desktop versus a laptop. Let's move on to the GPU. In the Geekbench 5 Metal Benchmark, the 24-core M1 Max scores 60,000, while the Vega 64 scores 12% higher at 68,000. In Geekbench 5 OpenCL, the M1 Max has a larger drop in performance, and the Vega 64 is now 24% higher. In Geekbench 4 OpenCL, the Vega 64 scores 170,000 and is still 24% higher. In GFX Bench Metal using the Aztec Ruins benchmark, the M1 Max at 1440p is 12% faster, and at 1080p that gap widens to 26%. In Basemark GPU, another metal benchmark, the M1 Max is just 7% faster. In 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme, a cross-platform benchmark, this one is optimized for metal on M1 base systems, not x86 base systems. To run this for the Vega 64, I had to reboot into Windows. In this benchmark, the M1 Max is at 94 frames per second, while the Vega 64 is at 92 frames per second. So the M1 Max is just 2% faster. To give you an idea of how the Vega 64 compares to other GPUs, while in Windows, I also ran 3D Mark Time Spy and Firestrike. For anyone who has seen one of my GPU videos, you can see that on this Time Spy chart, the Vega 64 is similar to an RTX 2060, and that is also comparable to an RX 5600 XT. In Luxmark, I have the Vega 64, the 24-core M1 Max in the Mac Studio, and also the 32-core M1 Max from the 14-inch MacBook Pro I previously tested. In general, these scores are relatively close, with the exception of the mic render scene, where Vega pulls ahead. I also ran the benchmarks in Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, all at the highest settings. And even at 4K, when the CPU is no longer the bottleneck for the M1 Max, the Vega 64 still comes out on top. Let's look at where this 24-core GPU in the M1 Max fits in comparison to all the other M1 GPUs. Taking the chart from my MacBook Pro GPU review, and including the scores for the M1 Ultra, I plotted the entire M1 family together. And from this chart, you can see that the M1 Max with 24 cores is a mid-range offering. And taking another chart from that previous video where I included desktop GPUs from AMD and NVIDIA, and plotting the 24-core M1 Max and the Vega GPU, you can see that it is similar to an RX 5700 GPU. That is further confirmation that this 24-core version is a mid-range GPU. Now for the SSD benchmark, the 512GB in the Mac Studio soundly defeats the Gen 3 NVMe drive in Big Mac. Big Mac would need a Gen 4 SSD, but since it only has a Gen 3 bus, it would need to run a RAID setup to compete. In the amorphous disk benchmark, we gain a little more insight into the speeds. It confirms the higher sequential read-write speeds of the Mac Studio. However, the random read-write speeds, and this is what we mostly experience, favors the Gen 3 NVMe drive in Big Mac. For the Blackmagic RAW speed benchmark, this tests the speed of decoding full resolution Blackmagic RAW frames. From here you can see the i9 is more than twice as capable as the M1 Max CPU, while the Vega GPU is 14% faster than the M1 Max. Interesting to note, the Mac Studio did perform slightly better than the M1 Max with 32 GPU cores in the 14-inch MacBook Pro which further shows why you should not upgrade to the M1 Max in that small laptop chassis. Finally, in Final Cut Pro, I did an export on four of my previous videos. I'll start with the same chart from my MacBook Pro review video, and then I'll add the Mac Studio and Big Mac. In the H.264 export, the Mac Studio is the same as the M1 Max in the laptop. Even though Big Mac is using Quick Sync with the i9 CPU, it loses across the board to the Mac Studio but it loses by seconds and is not a significant difference. Big Mac is much better than the base M1 in the Mac Mini and even the M1 Pro chips. Switching to 8-bit H.265 exports and the Mac Studio is again the same as the M1 Max in the laptop. However, the story really changes for the i9. 
Here, the i9 has the longest encode times and completes the encode in just under real time. The UHD 630 iGPU in the i9 obviously does not do as well with H.265. Okay, enough with the numbers. What have we learned? Overall, when using the Mac Studio from opening up apps and loading web pages, it does feel snappier, and that is to be expected since the single core benchmarks show it is faster. But it wasn't blow me away faster. It's an improvement, but not a big enough improvement that would warrant an instant need to upgrade. For all the different benchmarks I ran, the i9 multi-core performance is comparable to the M1 Max CPU, and the Vega 64 is comparable to the 24-core M1 Max GPU. I didn't expect this. I thought the new Mac Studio would have easily beat Big Mac, and that would have given me the justification to spend $2,000 on the new Mac Studio. There is one caveat to this. If you have upgraded to the newest cameras and are using the latest codecs, I haven't, then I would take the Mac Studio over Big Mac all day long. Big Mac is fine with the codecs of its day, but it will choke on the latest codecs. It's not the end of the world, but it does require making proxies and adding extra time to your workflow. If you are doing this on a daily basis, then it makes sense to get the Mac Studio. Now Intel does support the latest codecs in its 11th and 12th generation CPUs. However, Apple cut Intel off at the 10th generation. In using the Mac Studio for a couple of weeks, outside of the media engine, I get the sense that I'm using a mid-range like CPU, think i5 or Ryzen 5, and a mid-range GPU, think like a 60 series card. That mid-range computer would make a very nice 1080p gaming machine as well. And as I continue to watch the GPU prices slowly come down, that type of computer would be more akin to a $1,000 machine. Going over to PC Part Picker, I picked out a reasonable set of components that would also lead to an upgradable system, and when I did that, it confirmed my suspicion. And that left me with an uneasy feeling and a question. If a mid-range computer costs $1,000 and the Mac Studio costs $2,000, then am I paying $1,000 for the media engine? By the way, if you like videos like this, like, share, subscribe. And let me know in the comments below if you would like to see a dual purpose machine like this and how it would compare to the Mac Studio. And now I come to the part that no one is talking about. Did Apple get it wrong? Did Apple just walk away from their prosumer segment? The Mac Studio is obviously targeted for those who have a studio, but what about the prosumer? Previously, you could use a sub $2,000 computer like the iMac, complete with 5K monitor, keyboard, and mouse as a prosumer type device. You know, you're not there yet as a full professional creator making enough money to have your own studio, and yet you're still learning and growing your skills, and you have a tight budget. Previously, you could have that one computer function as a multi-purpose device. You also had the flexibility to run both Windows and Mac OS. Now with Bootcamp gone, you don't. Prosumers don't typically have big budgets. For a prosumer, that would make Apple Silicon Desktop Macs even less appealing. Getting back to that mid-range build I discussed earlier, how would it perform against the Mac Studio for half the price? To find out, we'll cover that next time. Thank you all so very much for watching. Stay safe, and I will see you in the next one.